It's ridiculous. It's crazy. Dude. I'm going to so. double check to make sure that I pushed record on everything. Yeah. I need a roadie. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like, I'm going to forget to push record at some point or something super basic. Oh, dude, yeah. No, it, I mean, it's, you know, with, with the work I do with photography and stuff, like, sometimes just having an assistant just yeah. hand you a lens. Like, it's just like, so you don't have to get up. Yeah. And get, you know, interrupted with your thing. It's just my primary focus should be having a conversation. Yeah. And yeah. so it really pulls you out to then totally. adjust cameras. And we, you know? same thing when I don't have an assistant, I'm like shooting. I'm like, hold on a second. Exactly. And it just yeah. it fucks up the whole rhythm of things. So. One day I'll get there. Yeah. You <laughs> Maybe will. on year 20. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Let's enter the conversation. I want to ask you what you did for your 50th birthday. For my 50th. I know it was a few years ago now. Yeah. But I yeah. thought it was compelling. Yeah, I'm 54 now. So, yeah, that was f four years ago. Um, so, actually, a couple things. The, I think I turned 50 on a family trip to Europe. So, we're in, pretty sure we're in um, Paris. And so, we just went out and had, is my daughter, who was maybe three at the time, and then my wife and I, and we just had a little dinner in Paris, which is really nice. And, um, but then when I came back right after that trip, I wanted to celebrate my birthday doing this thing where a lot of climbers do this thing where they try to do like out in Joshua tree. It's really popular. They try to climb 50 pitches on their birthday and a pitch is just a rope length, you know, hundred feet or whatever. So, but it's a really daunting task to try to, especially in Joshua tree, you have to run around all these different places and try to do it. And so I wanted to do it in Yosemite, so I linked a bunch of stuff up in Yosemite, and, and I wanted to climb 50 pitches in a day and then also run 50K um, a couple days later or whatever. And um, so the 50 pitches, I missed it just by six pitches. Oh. Yeah. It was, we kind of climbed out of Yosemite Valley up into Tuolumne, linked a bunch of climbs, and, and then we were up in this place called Cathedral Peak, which is about 11,000 feet, and it's, it's, uh, the climb itself is maybe six pitches of climbing, and that would have finished the whole thing. And we got up there, and it was dark and cold and windy, and, and uh, we could have done it, but it's like, what? who cares? I mean, right. I, I, I didn't pull it, you know? Like, and then the 50K thing was, uh, I've gotten into running the last uh, maybe six or eight years, and I always wanted to run parts of the John Muir Trail. Oh, yeah. Because there's people try to beat, there's people that run the whole thing, try to beat times, all these extreme kind of runners. And I just wanted to do little chunks. And so we ran from, uh, from Mammoth to Tuolumne Meadows, which is 50K. I think it's like 34 miles or something like that. And so that was kind of in celebration of my 50th there, trying to pull a couple things off. So you, you did complete that one? Yeah. yeah. In one day. Yeah. Um, why'd you get into running? Um, I was... Um, I started shooting some of these uh, endurance, um, these long distance runners when I was working for Patagonia. I'd go out and shoot these runners, and I was kind of like, running could be f for photos. It's pretty. It's 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 a lot of work and pretty fun. But like, I was like, uh, just not su super fired up, you know. Like, yeah. I was more into shooting, surfing, and climbing and stuff like that. And I shot these this guy and this girl running across uh, Zion National Park. And they have this thing where they, it's called fastest known time, the F, FKT, yeah, FKTs. And so they have this little thing where they try to beat everybody's time. It's like this little underground thing. There's a website for it and stuff. So you might look up at an area and, oh, what's the fastest known time at that time? Yeah, that place, I'm going to try to beat it. So they went and they climbed, I think they ran, it was like 48 miles in a day. And we documented, we shot video and shot some photos and stuff. And um I was blown away how they saw the whole park in a matter of hours, you know, like they covered so much ground, more ground than anybody would cover. And like, I mean, most people that would take like three days or four days of hiking and their scene was so cool that the, the running scene is kind of, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of an underground scene hmm. and the people are really hardcore and there's no money in it. Mm -hmm. And it kind of reminded me of, the skaters and the skating that I grew up with in the eighties. Cause was, when I was, uh, in the prime of my skating, skating was pretty underground. It wasn't, there's not a lot to it. And, uh, I just saw kind of that special thing. And these runners, like they were just doing it to one up each other, no money, 
very little fame and they're doing some of the gnarliest things, you know, they're running, some of them are running hundreds, literally hundreds of miles, you know, so I was really blown away by it. And so I was, I started getting interested in that. And, um, I like to climb. I, I got into climbing later in life. So trying to stay fit in Santa Barbara here where, or Ventura, where there's not a lot of climbing, it's like, can't surf all the time, not a lot of surf. So I just wanted a, a way to keep just my general fitness up. Yeah. So I, re- I read that book, uh, Born to Run. Mm-hmm. Have you heard of that book? Yeah. Incredible. You know, I started reading it and I'm like, this is a book on running. It's got to be the most boring book ever. And it was a total page turner, you know. And um, the premise to that book is how he changed his running. He was injured and uh, he, the doctor told him he couldn't run. Again. You know, he's got to stop running. He's like, oh, that's bullshit. So he started kind of looking into all this uh, barefoot running stuff, you yeah. know. And um, he changed the way he ran and just started running more on the balls of his feet instead of the heels. And and he was back to running hundreds of miles again. Wow. And uh, so he wrote a book on it. And that's what really grabbed me because I couldn't, when I moved over here from Hawaii, I was always running the soft sand on the North Shore, which is like running in snow. And it's really easy on your body. And when I started running here, I couldn't run over, you know, half an hour without my shins and knees going out. So... Mm. I drank the Kool-Aid, read that book, and I just started running on the balls of my feet and training myself. You have to totally retrain yourself on how to run because you, you've been told you got to run heel toe your whole life. And so yeah, and then I just started running, and now it's like something that I just I, I do. It's a, I don't I don't love it as much as some of these runners that I hang out with. You know, like they just love it. Yeah. Um, but it has its moments, and it's it's fun. It's cool. It's you, know, um, you can. You know, I go up to Yosemite. I was just up there on a job, and I just ran the Yosemite Falls Trail and back and stuff. And the do you do barefoot? No, but it's like barefoot inspired. Gotcha. I did try at at first. I ran. I just went to these real grassy football fields and just ran barefoot on the on the. You know, I watched the videos and everything, and read how how you're supposed to strike on the forefoot. And um, so I tried that a little bit. But I don't need to be running around barefoot, you know. So I was just using these uh, real minimal shoes. The whole point is that you feel the trail, yeah. and you're not. Since you're not running so hard, you're. It's like such a. It's more of a, a light run because you're. You're on your forefoot, and your foot is designed. It's it's this beautiful shock absorber that's designed to run on your toes. When you're running on your heels, it's just going boom right up to your back. You know, it's just there's no shock there. So. Um, so the shoes are designed without, you know, they have a drop, you know, a lot yep. of them. So they don't have a heel. They're flat and they're very, very little, um, sole there. So you can feel the trail, but you don't really need a lot of padding cause you're on your toes. And so, yeah, it's, it's just a totally different way of doing it. And, um, so yeah, I run in, run in shoes, but they're all kind of minimal and they're zero drop shoes and all that techie stuff. But, um, you haven't mentioned any of like the therapeutic aspects of it at all. Is that part of it for you as well? Mm. Yeah, it's, you know, when I said I don't love it, I do love it, but I'm not, um, like I have runner friends that are just, they can't, they're just dreaming about runs and they just can't, yeah. you know, stop running where it's, I'm not that fanatic, but I, I do love the benefits from it. I get really clear headed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just, even before this interview, I should have went for a run because it, it just, uh, it calms you down. Right. You know, like it, it's good to do if you have like a, a heavy workload that day and a lot of shit going on. You go for a run, it just kind of calms your whole system down and, and makes you, makes me a lot more clear headed. And That's, you know. yeah, I mean, that's a thing. As you get older, or you move away from the beach or whatever. Surfing provided all of that for all of us at a certain yeah. point, maybe for decades even. Yeah. But as your life changes, you need other things that you can kind of fill that space with. For sure, for sure. And running is one that it's just so convenient. You know, it's, it's so just, convenient. It's so easy. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you don't need a ton of time. You don't have to get changed into your wetsuit and out and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, or if you're if you're a cyclist, it takes a ton of time to get dressed for it, yeah. and you need four hours to really get the workout. You yeah, know, three thousand dollar bike. Yeah, exactly. Or something. You know, and but yeah, that's the yeah this the running part. I love. I'm kind of a minimalist, so I just love the simplicity. You just have a pair of shoes. Like, I even got to a point where I was, I just love the whole minimalist approach, but I was, like, not even wearing socks. 
and I just wear shoes and shorts, no shirt, no hat if I'm running like it in the morning or at night. And I'm like, this is so cool. I have nothing. Yeah. I'm just like shorts and shoes. You know, it's, there's something really pure about that, you know. And it's so much it's, easier when you have this environment, by the way. When you like, if you're yeah. living in a concrete jungle or suburbia and you're just mm. walking or running on gridded streets, quarter mile that way, left, quarter mile that Oof. way, you know, yeah. that's, it gets boring. Well, I can't do that. I can't, I mean, I, I'll run sometimes where there's street involved, but um, it hurts too. It's, mm -hmm. it's more jarring and it's totally. just not, you know, I'm, I'm lucky where I live right here. Part of the draw of moving up here was having trails of yeah. trails all around my house and some I've made myself and. So I can just bail here and I run for an hour or two and then come back and, Good. you know, it's a, but yeah, I mean, nothing takes the place of surfing, obviously, you know, it's, it's not like, oh my God, you should have seen this run. I came around this corner and it was just amazing. You know, surfing, it's obviously um, a better thing, you know, more interesting thing to do, but it's hard I, to surf all the time, especially when you're busy and older and I, um, I, li and stuff. I like to think that surfing is unique in that way because yeah. that's what I know. Yeah. And it, and it is like you're enveloped in mother nature and there's all these kind of things that I could argue would make it unique. Yeah. But the only thing that I've ever heard anybody talk about that represents that same connection is climbing. Mm. And so yeah. I, I don't know that to be true cause I don't climb, but I was actually yeah. going to ask you about that. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, um, no, it's interesting. I think about it all the time because I do both. Those that's right. two of my main things that I love to do, and um, climbing is is equally important as surfing is um, to me in my life. But um, yeah, it's it's um, it's it's funny. You can't really compare the acts because it's so different. And 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 I do go out on a limb with surfing is saying it is one of the most unique things you can do in this world. I, I really believe it is. Like it's there's nothing like that at all. And climbing's that the action of it is not at all, but it's it's the same. Whereas surfing, you're you learn to kind of adapt to your surroundings mm -hmm. and learn to work with your surroundings. You know, like when you and these are all things that you don't really notice until you think about it. But you know, you you jumped in that current. The current takes you out to the to the peak to get in. If the current and channel is too strong, you just take waves in. Like you're you're not conquering right. The, uh, the surroundings you're working with it so and you're becoming more harmonious I guess with your surroundings so climbing is kind of the same thing like a lot of rock climbers will disagree with that old mountaineering thing like we conquered the mountain it's like no you met the mountain on its terms and you rose with it and you summited because you you met it on its own terms and and that to me is similar to surfing it's like you have to it's, you have to be humble. You have to be able to make mistakes and learn from those. And, and in that way, it's really similar. Yeah. You're, you're never conquering it. And you never, like surfing, I mean, I'm sure Kelly is still figuring stuff out. Like you never get it dialed, you know. And climbing, there's always going to be something harder. There's always going to be somebody better. It's a real humbling thing, you know. And, and, and you fail a lot. Right. And you talk about climbers failing and, and how those are some of their most... Uh, kind of impactful climbs are the ones, not the ones where they made it. It's the ones that they failed on. And that's, that's how you get better. That's how you grow and all yeah. that. So yeah, it's real similar. And the people, the characters are real similar. Like the, I got into climbing late in life. I was always interested in it as a kid. I grew up in Northern California and going to Yosemite with my parents and stuff. And, and, um, so I knew about climbing and, and I was always really interested in it and kind of read about it. But, um, I, I moved to the North shore when I was like 18 or something. And, um, I, you know, I just didn't get into climbing until I was like the early thirties, 31 or something. And, um, and yeah, it, it was, uh, the characters right away. I'm like, Oh my God, that, you know, to me that they're the same, right? The Yosemite Valley is just like the North shore of Oahu. Right, it's where, right. um, it's the proving grounds. It's where everybody goes every year. And, and, um, I was like, Oh, that's the same character. I mean, they're, they're like, the, they're perfect fits you know that guy you could just put him on the north shore and he'd be the same dude you know and uh because you got these you know these real eccentric guys you got the the macho guys you got the you know type a guys the you know you just have all these different people in there there there's a lot of character in that you know and i don't know that was my attraction right away and again it was kind of like um the time that i got 
into climbing um, it was around two, early 2000s. And it's changed a little bit, but surfing, I came from, a, you know, the North Shore, which is the epicenter. Surfing, it's kind of a scene. Um, and I was blown away by the climbers because they were just so underground. Mm. You know, kind of reminded me, like I said, again, like the skaters I grew up with in the early 80s, there just wasn't money in it. It was like so underground. And, and these climbers were doing some of the most audacious shit in the world. And very little fanfare you know right. some of the best climbers in the world don't even have uh places to sleep in the valley they're still sleeping in their vans outside the valley you know I've and, seen and that. yeah and they're like the number one climbers and, right um so i just love the the humility of that and and uh it's still there in surfing but i was i you know i was in the thick of it in hawaii I, where it's just such a scene i was coming to you know yosemite valley and seeing the same thing but it's just so much more underground and low-key you know at the, in the two, early 2000s on the North Shore, there's millionaire surfers that are 18 years old, you know? So mm -hmm. at that point, it had already exploded. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's go back then. Danville, California, you grew up playing ball sports, and uh, you got a skateboard at some point, and that changed everything, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, what was the introduction? <laughs> what was the year? Who got you the skateboard, and what was the... Uh, oh, yeah, I, it's a, there's a lot going on there, because... I actually remember the day where my life changed, and um, I think that's kind of funny that I know the day that it changed. But um, yeah, I played, you know, soccer, baseball, football. Played all that, and uh, and I think I, how did it go down? I so one of the biggest inspirations to me was a guy that lived in my neighborhood that had motorcycles and skateboards and surfboards. His name's Jimmy Olson. And uh, so Danville, you got to understand, there's probably the way surfing is now. It's like, what is it, an hour, and a half, two hours away from Santa Cruz. It's 45 minutes to an hour away from Ocean Beach, maybe even longer. Um, it's a landlocked town. And in the 70s and 80s, when I grew up there, there was Jimmy Olsen was like the one surfer from there. Oh, I mean, okay. I'm sure there's surfers now. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. But um, he was like the one guy. And uh, he lived on my street. And he was... The typical kind of the atypical cool California kid, long blonde hair. He he rode. He raced like a XR seventy fives and one twenty fives. He had motorcycles. He had Toyota Tonka trucks, you know, with the big tires. And he surfed. And he was like the the epitome of cool, you know. And um, I was a lot. I was like five, four or five years younger than him, watching him and just obsessed with what he's doing. But I was playing like baseball and all this stuff. And um. So he's the one that got me kind of into skateboarding and surfing and a uh, huge, huge inspiration. But it wasn't until, um, like, I couldn't really surf till I started driving. Of course, you know? yeah. So, um, but he was there. So he was, he was somebody that I really looked up to. And I, I, w I don't know what it is, but I had this real thing about individuals as a, at a young age. And I don't know if it's my dad or my mom, but cause they always told me not to follow people, just be your own person and mm. blah, blah, blah. And, um, I had this admiration of, of the individual, the person that can stand on its own. And, and I kind of saw that in like Jimmy Olsen, like he's doing these things that he's just one person. He's not on a team. He's riding motorcycles, he's skateboarding, he's surfing and, and I thought that was really unique. And then um, <laughs> this is kind of a, you can edit this, right? It's just a long story, but. Yeah, or not. But it's, I or can not. leave it in. Yeah, it's <laughs> like uh, it, it, my life changed. Like I remember I was kind of into, um, so this is probably late 70s. Um, vans were starting to become a thing a little bit, okay. but they weren't really a thing in Danville. You know, Dan, it's landlocked town. And I somehow got onto vans. I just loved vans. And this kid moved to Washington from, I'm sorry, this kid moved to Danville from Washington and he, he, we became friends. He's on the football team, on my football team. And he goes, Hey, I want, I want to get some new clothes, like in some shoes. My mom gave me money for shoes, you know? And, and it's so different back then. Like a kid from Washington dresses so different from a kid from oh, Danville, yeah. California. Now it's kind of all similar, but um, he kind of wanted to fit in. Right. So he picked the wrong guy to, <laughs> to go shopping with but I went downtown with him and we went to the store and I saw it was the first time I saw checkerboards on the sole and I was like holy shit man this is the coolest thing ever I, if I had money I would buy these like you know I'm so jealous but 
the, this is the ship. This is what you need to get. And he's like, really? So he bought these vans. And um, I never saw him wear them, right? He bought those vans, whatever. And then we had our last football game of the year. And I had ordered, my mom was really into helping me. You could order vans back then, any color you wanted, you know? So my mom was like, she'd help me get on. It's not even a website, but I don't even know how we'd figure it out. You fill out a form. Sure. And they just started making um, checkerboard on the, on the fabric. And I saw it in the catalog or whatever. That is so cool. You can get checkerboard. So I ordered these special order vans, you know, um, that actually had checkerboard, you know? Yeah. That you see everywhere. Yeah. And um, so I was really excited about these shoes. And uh, we had our football game. And I remember coming out of the locker you know, we all took showers and stuff and I'm putting on my new Vans. I'm so stoked, you know. And I walk out of the locker room and the, all the, like, the cool guys in the football team were lined up and they're all laughing at me and making fun of my shoes and, like, pointing at me and stuff. And I was looking at them and I was like, fuck, like, you know, and I just wanted to walk away. You know, you're getting made fun of by the whole team, you know. And all I could do is look at this guy that has a pair of checkerboard Vans in his closet and I'm like motherfucker like you didn't even have the balls to wear that <laughs> and and I, I suddenly got a chip on my shoulder I'm like none of you guys can stand on your own you're all part of a crew you all lean on each other for something and like none of your individuals none of you can stand on your own fuck you guys interesting and because it could have broken you you know rather than fortify you yeah I mean it was I mean I was being made it was one of those things I'm like I wanted to bail like I mean that when you're what, 12 years old and the whole football team's making fun of you, you know, I was just like, I didn't want to be there, but I was like, you know what, fuck you guys. And uh, that changed everything. I got, I got a skateboard. I already kind of dabbled in skateboarding, but uh, I think through Jimmy, that guy on my street got a skateboard, started listening to punk rock, cut my hair, and that was it. Quit wow. all board sport. I mean, quit all the ball sports. Yeah. And, you know, it was a, a full rebellion. You know, I, Instantly, I was at odds with parents, teachers, you know, I'd wear shirts that say jock on them and with a big cross through, you know, and I'd get, I mean, I'd, I'd get beat up by jocks, you know, like skating around town and carload of jocks would pull up and beat me up and stuff. And, but you're asking for it, you know, you're, it's just like that yeah. age. And, and, uh, so that really, I, I look back on that now, um, now more than ever, I, I realized that that was a real turning point in my life of where I was going to go with everything, like what I valued in people and what I valued as far as, um, something to do with myself, you know, like, um, I, I just didn't think, didn't find anything attractive about ball sports after that. And, and of course there's nothing wrong with those, those sports, but, um, and that just sent me on this whole trajectory where I just, my life just took a, a turn right there. And, um, yeah, it's probably the most, the biggest turning point in my life, I think was, I, <laughs> was that. So I could see your dad, your parents encouraging you to be an individual and to carve your own path. Kind, one, of, back, kind of backfired yeah. right there. You know? Yeah, the path that you decided to take. Yeah. Were they apprehensive about it? Or were oh, they so, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. It was, it you, was, got, you got kicked out of school too, right? Yeah, in high school. Yeah, I can kind of kicked out. Yeah, kicked out basically. But yeah, I mean, it, my parents weren't stoked, right? Like they knew that being in sports will keep you out of trouble. You know, now I'm not in sports and I'm not doing well in school. I'm riding skateboards. They don't know what I'm doing. And that was the whole attraction with my friends. You know, we all kind of met each other. Like all of us had issues or whatever we had going on and we all kind of found each other and skateboarding was that glue that held us together and right. we were like a tight crew. And the whole thing about it that we loved and we, I didn't know it then, but now looking back, is like we love the fact that people didn't know what we were doing. Like the, mm -hmm. our peers at school didn't know what skateboarding was. Our parents are like, what do you guys do? You just disappear on your, what is that? And, and that was the whole cool thing about it. And, and it, was, it was every time you left the house, it was just this blank canvas that you can just go do stuff. There weren't coaches telling you what to do. There's, you're, you're just kind of riffing off each other. You're trying to one-up each other. There's like a healthy amount of competition, but it's all down to you and and it was super exciting time and we were you know it was a we were doing things we weren't supposed to be doing you know we were we were really interested in getting outside of our little suburban bu bubble there in Danville and we started you know thumbing rides or 
riding the BART bus to other towns, you know, and, and, you know, our parents had no idea what we were doing. I mean, we were going into Berkeley, San Francisco at age 13, you know, and cruising around the streets and getting into trouble, you know, and, and I just remember coming back to school on a, like a Monday and thinking like, you know, what did you guys do this weekend? Like, <laughs> you know, cause like I saw some heavy shit out in San Francisco and for sure, you know, and, uh, and the cool thing about it, the interesting thing about it is by the time we had our driver's license, we already had a network of friends throughout the entire Bay Area. And, you know, obviously before social media or anything, like just telephones, I don't know how we did it all, but, you know, we're skating pools. And, you know, that was in the early 80s when skateboarding was just done. There were, you know, um, it was a point where um, all the magazines went under. A lot of the hard good companies were gone. The skate parks were all closed. So we were, you know, it was, it was drainage ditches, backyard pools. It was the street, you're building your own ramps. Um, you know, it was a full-on little Wild West time of skate, skating. And, uh, you know, we had, by the time we were 16, we had this network of all these friends. We already knew everybody all over the Bay Area. It was like this crazy, you know, um, group of kids that we were kind of involved with all over. And, uh, and I think that really set the tone of just things, you know, for the rest of my life, at least, of just traveling. And that was like my first taste of real adventure. Like, right getting on that bus and going into San Francisco when you're 13 years old was like a huge deal, you know? And, um, and, you know, there's a lot is, it was my poor parents, you know, that, um, you know, there's a lot of drugs back then and, um, still is, but, um, you know, we were smoking weed and doing all this stuff and stealing get, lumber, stealing lumber. We, we got, um, yeah, we got busted for that finally. Um, yeah, we, uh, we got, I got busted with like 300 sheets of plywood in my truck, my dad's truck. And he was a general contractor, oh, which yeah, is even right. worse. And I was on probation for weed at the time. And we all got thrown in like, it was classic. Like we all got thrown in separate jail cells and stuff. And they called our parents. And we were building this huge ramp on a, um, on a friend's tennis court. It took up, it was a big vert ramp. It took up the whole tennis court. And we're all lying like, hey, his family's like, where is this wood coming from? They're like, oh, you know, saying my dad donated. And I'm saying, oh, Georgie Furtado's dad donated. And like, but we are stu- we just go out on weekends stealing wood. Like yeah. we would go to a party and then after the party break up, we'd jump in my truck and just go to lumber sites, you know, construction sites, and just load up. And that's how we built it, you know. I've seen images of that ramp. It's, oh, in- yeah. it's insane. In the skateboard book or in the... Uh, I think it was in that... Um, you were giving a talk somewhere on YouTube. Like oh. a, a presentation. looked like a TED Talk almost. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you had images of all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Because in the earlier images of the ramps that you had built were scary looking. I mean, super sketchy. So sketchy, yeah. So sketchy. You know, you're just like... Yeah. You're finding shit in the yard and you're just nailing it up. And, you know, you might find this, might find whatever. Yeah. And you just make these things that are just death traps yeah and then as it progresses and you have that huge half pipe on the tennis courts it looks professionally built yeah and and i look back on it and i'm of course it's me and my friends that i'm all excited about but like i look at it i go i can't believe a bunch of 16 year olds built that i can't either it's a huge and they're and it it wasn't just us these were there are pockets of us kids just like us all over the United States at the time, you know, right, it was, right, right. it was still a small scene, but there's like kids like us in, you know, in Texas and in San Diego and, you know, all over the place. And, uh, you know, we figure out how to build these things and they look like, you know, I, I'm like, how did the bunch of 16 year olds build this, you know, and they're, they're, they're done really well and huge, right? Like totally, you know, taking up an entire tennis court. And I don't even know of the rough costs of that because we stole all of it. You know, it must be 20, <laughs> 30 true. grand and just wood, right? Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, if you think about the, the layers, you, back then you had to do three layers of three eights and it was 32 sheets per layer, right? So that's like 100 sheets of plywood right there. And then you have to layer it masonite. And, you know, what was a piece of plywood is 10 bucks back then. Just in plywood, you're looking at thousands of dollars just for the plywood, you know? I mean, incredible. Incredible. So yeah. Anyways, we got we got busted, and uh, finally the parents got in. What is going on here? Then they realized, oh my god, they you know all the parents got together and they're like these kids have been stealing all this wood, and so they finally helped out with the last couple layers and stuff. And and um, <laughs> <laughs> most parents would have demoed that. Man. Oh, I can't believe they didn't. But I think it was it would be hard. Like we put all that work into it. Like it was a beautiful 
you know, they were actually work. impressed by your I think resolve kind of, and your engineering. And I think my dad was like, he was a general contractor. He was like, holy shit, these kids are doing something here. And, and you know, the thing is, is like, we, we didn't even think to ask because we didn't, we're all, we're all so on our own with the thing. We, we didn't want it, help. Like, yeah. you know, and that was half the fun is stealing yeah. this stuff, you know, so. Um, but yeah, so the, so yeah, the, it wasn't an easy time for my parents and a lot of the parents around Danville at the time is like, you know, um, kid, we were getting in a lot of trouble and there was, there's a, a dark side to some of that too. You know, sure. there wasn't, it wasn't always super fun and definitely not for the parents, you know, I mean, there's the punk scene was happening in that time, the early eighties punk scene. And, um, I remember there was like this thing called parents against punks or something like it was just like people our parents were having meetings because we we're all running away from home we're all doing some crazy shit and they're like how do we just corral what's going on with our kids you know it was, and if they listen to the music itself they have to be horrified oh it's and, such a stark contrast from Burt Bacharach or whatever they were listening <laughs> yeah, and the to the Beatles and stuff you know? yeah it's Engelberg like, Humperdinck yeah, yeah yeah exactly I mean I used to lay there I just lay there with my headphones on going to sleep at night listening to like black flag and yeah, you know, yeah, Christ, yeah, yeah. a band called christian death you know and, and uh you know just some dark shit you know and i'm like how did i fall asleep to that shit you know and like but yeah I, and there are times when my parents would hear something or you know they did they did um how to i forget we had a big falling out over something and my dad my mom and dad took away all my albums all my punk rock albums. Well, every album, but it was all mostly punk rock. And then we all had tons of tapes, you know, because I had probably a hundred tapes that uh, radio stations and other people's music. And so took all my albums, all my tapes. And it was a, it was like a big falling out. Like it, that didn't go well with me and, uh, or them. And, and I didn't get it back till I was like in my mid twenties. Wow. I was at my dad's office and he goes, Oh yeah, I have this box. And he gave me like, I'm like, Oh my God, like really good albums. Like the first, uh, Minor Threat Out of Step album that wow. I ordered off Thrasher Magazine for five bucks. That's in there. Um, first Black Flag, you know, um, Jealous Again, you know, wow. Damaged albums. Like, there's some really good albums in there. But, but yeah, they, they took, you know, they were trying to figure out what to do with me, you know. Like. My equivalent of that was buying Sublime's first couple albums oh, because yeah. I heard about them in Lost videos. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're like, so good. In the mid-90s, Lost mm. was using those early Sublime uh songs you know yeah 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 songs that they would later re-record and put on like their big album that yeah. blew up 40 ounces to freedom or whatever yeah, yeah, it yeah, was yeah. but yeah. they had like earlier studio versions of it on the earlier yeah albums. you can find those yeah they're they're just a little rougher they're not yeah. as polished yeah 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 and it was like man where can i find this music and then you go to <laughs> you know the local record shop and find it and feel like you're first in on something yeah isn't that interesting how i mean it's just so different how you find stuff now like there's um, I think Sean Stussy wrote this whole thing. Did he write? Yeah. This whole thing on creativity on how, and he wasn't being um, bitter about, oh, those were the days today. It sucks today. It was better then. But he was just saying how, how you got your inspiration, how you went down these different paths was so much more intentional and it took so much more work. Like, and I think that's when, back in the day, when you, when you found somebody that was kind of into what you're doing, you, you, you saw this thing in them like, Whoa, I know what you had to go through to find this. And what do you got? Yeah. You yeah. know, like, and there's a thing there. And he was talking about, you know, being a, you know, he was a shape surfboard shaper to begin with, but you know, he's going to Japan, he's checking out the styles and, you know, he started Stussy clothing that way, but to get there, how, what he went through to get there was such a big deal yeah. you know, to, you'd see this one shoe that you saw in like, you know, Shibuya, Japan and, go there and you, then you find a little zine from there i mean it's like you just it's like following these little uh treasure hunts you know? sure um, yeah but the record stores were awesome you'd go in there and find you know flip through the record stores and find sometimes it'd just be the cover of the album like what the fuck is this you that know? was so much of those albums the yeah. artwork you know yeah oh yeah 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 i think that's missing with a lot of music nowadays <laughs> part of the experience was just that the sleeve like you're totally. looking at the sleeve and you're Turn on the back. I used to get into like who played like sometimes another band member exactly, somebody yeah. else would play and you're like, oh, no. So back to your storyline, I know you moved to, you mentioned you moved to Hawaii <laughs> when you were 18. You'd gotten kicked out of high school. Did you ever finish high school? 
I did. So oh, okay. when I say I got kicked out, it, it was kind of, I kind of call it kicked out, <laughs> um, which I think it was the, I, in my sophomore year in high school, I ran away from home and, um, lived in this secret room, in my friend's house for a week. And his mom didn't, even, it's a, it's literally you, uh, in the, in the hallway, you open the closet and there's clothes and you part the clothes and there's a little door and you open that door and you're in an attic. And I lived mm-hmm. in that attic without his mom knowing for like a week. He's just passing you trays of food. Oh yeah. I mean, I would sneak in there and then they'd all go to school in the morning and I'd wake up and just make myself a bowl of cereal and go skate. He had a, it's in the book. He's got, um, he had a half pipe in his barn. So I just go okay. skate the half pipe until everybody got out of Crazy. school. Away. Like, but anyways, all fun and games for me, just horrible for my parents. But um, so anyways, I, I missed a bunch of school and I was, uh, doing horribly in school already. And so they brought me in there with the principal and the principal, Mr. Morrison, I just remember this guy, like he, he hated me. Like he's just, you can tell, I mean, you, you don't like to think that about teachers and stuff like, but I think he really just didn't like me. You know, I think he really wanted me out of that school. And, um, So in the meeting, he said, look, Jeff can stay here, but um, he's not going to graduate on time. He'll have to repeat a year. And when you hear that as a kid, like, there's no way you're going to stay another year after. Impossible, right? And he knew that, you know. So I think, to me, I think he was like, gave us a choice that really wasn't a choice, you know. And so I was just like, forget that. And um, there's this continuation school over across town where all the so-called losers go to, you know? So um, I really wanted to go there because it was so lax. It was like babysitting, you know? All I wanted to do is just skate, you know? And so I ended up going to that school, and it was it was classic. Like, I could write, write volumes of stories on that school, but it's, you know, where pregnant women, oh, yeah. um, kids have been in juvenile hall. There's like, you know, this is the 80s, so there's like stoners and punkers and metalheads, and, you know, it's like, tons of riffraff there and uh so i ended up going to that school and um which is basically just being they just you're out early like they just it's kind of babysitting there and so i went there for a while and um which is great for me for a time because all i want to do is just fuck off basically and uh and then i got busted going back to that thing i got busted for weed when i was a kid um like, I think it must have been that year. Yeah. End of my sophomore year. Got busted for weed, and then I got busted for that wood, stealing wood, and I got put on probation and got put on piss tests. And I found out years later, not till I was like 30 or something, my mom said, oh, they didn't even put you on. They, they were just going to slap your hand, and she was pissed that they were just slapping my hand. And she goes, I demanded that they put you on piss tests, but they it's expensive and they weren't, so they, they were fake tests. Oh my God. I found, thank God for my mom. Right. Yeah. Um, so, but I was so paranoid cause she's just like, you get a dirty test, you're going to juvenile hall, you know? And, and last thing I want to do is go to juvenile hall. So I sobered up and stopped smoking weed and, uh, because I was so f- frightened of going to juvenile hall. And so, um, I kind of sobered up over that summer and I remember by the end of the summer, I told my mom, I go, I don't want to go to that school again. I, I just really felt I felt like what it was, you know, like I was just going nowhere. And uh, so they did a little research and they found this um, kind of private school that was ran by um, ex-hippies in a couple towns over called North Bay. And um, it was cool. It was, it was a, the perfect thing for me, and but it cost money. And so my parents didn't trust me. And so they said, um, if you're going to go to this school, you're going to have to pay half the tuition and that means you got, you know, I, I always had a job in high school. So you got to work summers, you got to work, you know, part time while you're going to school and you got to pay half. And then if you because if that if I get kicked out, they lose. Right. They yeah. lose. And so they go, you pay half the tuition. Then when you get, graduate, we give it to you back. Oh, give it wow. All to you back. Okay. So, That's um, a good incentive. No, it was great. Yeah. I mean, I had to work for it, you know. Yeah. So and I, I wasn't a great student, um, never was. But um that school did wonders. Like I had the, it was, you know, all first name basis. They, um, homework wasn't a thing. They didn't believe in homework. Um, everything you did, you had to get 85% or better until you moved on. And, um, it kind of changed my deal. I started kind of, um, actually doing my schoolwork and kind of having a little more interest in school. Good. 
and graduated and I had like a few thousand dollars in the bank as an 18 year old, you know, and I just moved to Hawaii right after my buddy and I moved to Hawaii right after graduation. Well, I'm glad they found that school for you. Cause I was going to ask you, um, not knowing that you had actually found that fit, but I was going to ask you, or at least just illustrate that in a different environment, you could have been a straight A student and mm-hmm. ended up in an Ivy League. So you say you're a bad student, but you're clearly intelligent. Yeah, and I you're don't know cl- about straight A student. But, really? But I don't know. I mean, don't you're know. clearly intelligent, and you have the discipline and the, all the other things that come with mm-hmm. what's required. School isn't that hard. It's just that you don't want to be there, basically. And yeah. if school knows how to meet the student, mm-hmm. you know, there's so many schools nowadays. Oh, yeah, yeah. Where they totally. know kind of how to meet the student at their level and yeah. not just give them structured, standardized testing yeah. that may or may not apply to them. Yeah. So it's almost a shame. I feel like you were rebelling against a larger kind of societal factor, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it is almost a shame that so many kids of certain generations get painted with such a broad stroke that... Yeah, because... N- no kids the same, you know, and some kids fit really well into the system, you know, and then there's kids like myself that didn't fit. And, um, or if you were born 20 years later, you'd be diagnosed with something and yeah. medicated for it. Yeah. I guaranteed I had some kind of learning disability or yeah. something, but I just couldn't sit still. I couldn't, you know, I was always behind and that that's what happens when, I mean, that's pretty much what happened to me. I think is like you, you're a little kid, you're, you're not doing as well as your, your peers, you're right. falling behind. And then what do you, you just become a troublemaker? Cause that's what you, you become the class clown. You find other ways to make yourself feel better. You, you know, you get into skating, you maybe you do well at skateboarding and that feels good. And, you know, and then you're, you're just on that different road, you know, yeah. and it's different nowadays. I think they can help those kids, you know, but I think you're right. I don't think I would have been a straight A student gone on to Ivy league schools, but um, I definitely, towards the end of that time at school, I was more interested in learning. I didn't do, I, I started getting better grades, but um, a, a real saving grace was this uh, teacher, my English teacher. She's my English and literature teacher. And we'd write stories and she kind of, she was like, you, you, you like writing, like you're good at it, you know? And, and um, when I graduated and moved to Hawaii, she would send, she sent me a journal to write in. And she sent me constant books. It was so cool. She's th- this girl, Lisa Burke, this lady, Lisa Burke. And um, she was really, I mean, that was after I graduated. And she was like, you need to write in this journal. You need to read. And she sent me, she sent me all these classics that I was kind of supposed to read in school, you know, like Steinbeck and The Great Gatsby and all these classics, you know. But then I also stumbled on Charles Bukowski and, and uh, Herman Hesse and, all these great writers. And so all suddenly I was reading all these classics and I just became this real avid reader. I was just reading constantly. And I, that wasn't me in, in high school, you know, and um, it's all because of her. She just kept on feeding these books. And, and I remember telling her, you know, kind of towards the end of school, I was like, Hey, I, I just read really slow. You know, I'm just a slow reader. And she goes, you know, don't, don't speed up. You're going to, you'll retain more. You'll enjoy it. There's no read to read. There's no reason to read faster. You're going to, enjoy it more if you just slow down and stay slow so I took that and I just I became this avid reader and I I wrote in my journal constantly and and I just became this lover of of words you Hmm. know um you know I I went on I mean I just started reading all these classics that you're supposed to read that when you're young you're like what who the hell is Dostoevsky like yeah yeah sounds horrible but then you read Dostoevsky and you're like holy shit like, who are these people, you know? Um, um, so she really kind of changed my life with that, you know? Did you recognize that that was special at the time? That she was isolating you and identifying you as having something unique? Because clearly she wasn't doing that for all her students. Yeah, I, didn't, I don't know. That's a good question. I never well, really thought about it. Because now, I, yeah, it is special. That she, totally special that she was doing that, you know? Well, the way yeah. I'm thinking of it is um, you could have easily felt like a burnout because you were labeled as such, yeah, yeah right? Yeah. And then she identified something special in you, which I, as an adult, I'm around a lot of kids. Yeah. And if I saw a kid who I knew had a unique talent that was specific to some skill set that I have or knowledge that I have, yeah, yeah. I would want to cultivate that in, in them as well, you know? Yeah, yeah, I would yeah. be like, yeah. man, it's rare for a little kid to show a unique talent in that way. How can I help that kid get that out of them? And that's what she did for you. Maybe she saw something because I still, even though I did better in school, um, in my last two years there, yeah, you know, with her as a teacher, 
I still wasn't embracing education like it was a thing, you know. Um, I, I didn't I didn't go off to college. I, I did try college eventually, like twice, but I couldn't do it. But I think, yeah, maybe she saw something. She must have seen something Clearly. in one of my stories or whatever. And go, oh, this, he's got something there a little bit. But have but, you maintained contact with her? Does she know what you ended up doing? I we hung out like she. No she, way. We hung out a few times. She, um, she. I was re- <laughs> after the whole punk rock thing. I got really into like. Um, I went backwards. Like, uh, and I, I, I just read this thing with that Henry Rollins just wrote too, and I. I I think a lot of kids had this same kind of path with music, but Henry Rollins was talking about how it's the same thing. Probably I'm, I'm like most kids that were into punk rock in those days. Is like the, the music at the time was horrible. It was like glam rock, big stadiums, um, you know, big guitar solos, disco, you know, it was just really shallow and kind of hero worship and stuff. And what punk rock did is, is kind of pull it all back and kind of made it rock and roll again, even though it was, it was wacky and crazy. But it's like, that's what rock and roll was. It was like little clubs and people just lost their shit, you know, watching a band play. And that's what punk rock was. So punk rock kind of kind of stepped it back and made it rock and roll again. But everybody just got so immersed that you're like, everything else sucks. I'm just mm-hmm. into punk rock. So you go through that, right? And then you start really listening to music. So what punk rock did to me, and I, this is what Henry Rollins was write about, writing about in his path, is like, then you start being more discerning about your music. Because up to punk rock, I was just spoon-fed stuff. Oh, just whatever's on the radio. And you're just like, you're a passive listener. And then what punk, punk rock did has made you a discerning listener. And then I just backtracked. And I, went, I backtracked all the way through the 60s and started okay. listening to all the hippies. All the people we we just thought hippies were the lame, you know. Yeah. Punk rockers were just like you fucking dirty hippies, you know. But um, now I started kind of going into all the '60s and '70s and all that, listening to that. But then I got into this whole phase of like, I guess they call it prog rock now or math rock of oh, like okay. real musician music. And I was into this band King Crimson, and so she said she was tripping out that this kid in her high school was listening to a bunch of King Crimson. And so she, the first time we hung out after uh, high school, she got a hold of me and she goes, hey, I got free, uh, I, I can work the aisle at a King Crimson concert. You can work it with me. You want to come? So I hooked up with her and we went and saw King Crimson play and hung out. And we kind of kept a, like, we kind of kept in touch a little bit. She's sending me books, but then we, we kind of, we'd talk on the phone here and there. She visited me in Hawaii once or twice. and Amazing. So, she, yeah, and so th- I haven't seen her in probably... It's probably been 20 years. Oh, wow. But um, what a she great... was a huge inspiration in my life. Like, yeah. Yeah, she's, she really, if she didn't do that, I don't think I would have ever gotten into half the things, you know. Have you um, listened or heard Henry Rollins' radio show that he did on KCRW? I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it. It's good. <laughs> I don't know if he's still doing it. I listened to it. Um, last time I heard it was probably three or four years ago. Uh-huh, and uh-huh. at that time he had been doing it for three or four years. Yeah. Is, is it still on? Is it still I don't on? know. Huh? But it was only one hour. Yeah. 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 And I feel like it was on Saturday nights at like 10, just like the worst slot you could get. Yeah. Really? Yeah. 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 Uh, but they, at that time they had just started putting it all on the internet as well. Mm. So I would just catch it midweek on the internet on my own terms. It must've been pretty good, right? Like- it was really good. And it would be like, he might play something that was, um, new Mm -hmm. you know like oh this is new arcade fire let's say or whatever it was yeah and then he'd come out of that and be like so anyways we were playing in a club in detroit in 1987 and um you know we just got off the stage at 2 a.m and i went to the bathroom and i was coming out of the bathroom and some guy walked up to me and he handed me a mixtape or like his demo tape or whatever it was. Anyways, this is song number three on the B side of that click. And he puts it and you're like, what? You're expecting him to say they went on to become. Yeah. 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 Whatever or whoever. And it's like, Nope, this is just a random. This is it. Demo tape that somebody handed him, you know? Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. It was really an interesting show. In that way, he's, he's way more, I I really admire him because he's way more interesting now than he was when he was in black flag. Cause like, when I think it must, so that album came out, his first album with Black Flag, Damaged, I think it came out in 81. I think that's about right. And so I think that's when I probably heard it is around that time. And of course, you're so psyched. But the more I looked into him, he's kind of this militant jock 
<laughs> character, you know, he's not as cool as I thought. And then he got into his long hair and, and dancing you know, on stage in his fishnets and short, short, like it, it was just this kind of almost rock and roll thing. Like, but he's, he's gotten more interesting as he's gotten older. Like he doesn't really want to just be, he's not stuck in the past. Cause a lot of people from that era are stuck in the past. They still just listen to punk rock and that's it. And his whole thing was just, you know, moving forward like mm -hmm. punk rock. And that's how I feel about punk rock. It was just a, it came around at a perfect time to pull everything back. And it was a way of moving forward. It wasn't a nostalgic thing. It was like, and, and, and that's how I see it. And I think that's how, he's done it he's he's like evolved and he's become a different person he's not henry rollins a black flag anymore he's right. he travels he's he's got a whole different world out there and there, but there's a lot of guys from his era that are just like they're stuck you know yeah and um he, yeah i saw him doing oh he did a, uh he does these like open mic not open mics but these uh kind of spoken word things yes yeah. right here in santa barbara and uh we went down and watched them and it was insane he just He's such a great speaker, and he just, he just held your you're just gripped on the edge of your seat for mm -hmm. like an hour and a half, and he does it like he's, you know, he's holding the mic, like like he it's like he's on stage singing, you know, it's it's like yeah he's, he's still that guy he's intense, but um he's I really watched, good. Literally last week I rewatched Heat, the Michael Mann film. Oh, I don't know if I've seen that. Okay, it's a huge action film from like 20 years ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah okay, with like yeah. Robert De Niro, yeah, yeah, yeah. Al Pacino, Val Kilmer. Yeah. Henry Rollins is in it. Is he? He's in it. And he's, he's got not, all these bit parts. Like, yeah, he, he does. Yeah, so and funny. I totally, I had seen the movie 10 years ago, probably. And when he came on screen, I was like, oh, I forgot he's in this. Yeah, I forgot yeah, that yeah. he even acts, you know? Yeah, he's, yeah, he's, uh, yeah, yeah he's, he's cool. He's an interesting dude. He really is. He He's yeah, I have a bunch of his books and stuff. Like he's he's great. So land in Hawaii when you're 18 years old. What year was that? And what was uh, you had a little bit of money, but what was your plan to work and live and all that sort of stuff? Yeah. So the uh, my buddy and I, who I grew up skating with, um, Matt Charlo, he he and I were we when we were 16, we were on a family trip with my family in Kauai. Oh, okay. And um, that's the second time I've ever been there. And, and uh, my first time in Kauai, I just freaked out because all I knew was Lake Tahoe mm -hmm. and Santa Cruz. I just didn't know warm water existed. And uh, that's when I really fell in love when, with Hawaii was when I was a little kid, like 10 years old. But then on another trip, when I was 16 with Matt, we uh, one night on the beach, we shook hands and we just made a, a plan that we're going to move here after high school. And of course, we went back, you know, we still had two more years of high school left. And everybody, our parents, our friends are like, yeah, yeah, right. Sure. Everybody says that they come back from Hawaii, we're going to move there. And we said, no, we're going to, that's what we're going to do. So we worked every summer, we saved our money. And um, right when we graduated, it was 87. Okay. We were both 18. Um, we moved to Diamond Head right next to we want to move to Kauai, but you know it's your first time away from home we don't know about jobs you know what are we going to do on Kauai? you know we just thought you know honolulu waikiki would be the our best bet to find a job and so yeah so we lived right next to diamond head and uh right between kind of waikiki and diamond head right there in montserrat and uh yeah we had a little apartment and my job was uh i was a landscape maintenance guy at the it was a kahala hilton at that time right around the corner. And I did that. For, I think I started at like five in the morning was off at two so I could surf. And, um, I was doing trips out to the North shore and surfing the South shore. And we were skating a lot too. We we're skating. I don't know if you've heard of wallows. It's kind of like yeah. this legendary place, but, um, we we're skating wallows. We we're skating, but some of the backyard pools around there. And, and, um, but that's when I, that's when I got more into surfing. Cause I, I couldn't really surf until I was driving. So I, I started kind of late, you know, in Danville. So I was surfing, but you know, back before reports, you know, half the time I'd go to the ocean, it was just horrible, you know, but, um, so I surfed a, some in my high school years, but that's when I really started surfing more and going to the North shore. And, and then, um, I was there for a while and then moved back to Danville for, I think I was back for a year or something. Um, I actually went to Santa Barbara. I went to um, junior college right here for okay. two semesters and uh, hardly did college or anything. And then um, then moved back to the North Shore. So I think I landed, went to Hawaii in 87, lived on the South Shore, came back and then went to the North Shore in 90. Okay. 
So that's when I that's when I landed on the North Shore and then stayed there for about fifteen years after that. Um when did you meet the Malloy brothers? Was that there? Yeah. It was okay. like mid nineties, like ninety five. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um I know you became a lifeguard at some point and a flight attendant. Yeah. Which yeah. happened first? The flight attendant thing. Okay. So yeah, I was living um for a couple of years. I was do you know the North Shore that well? Yeah. Like you know Chun's Reef? Yep. There's a, the only house on the Malka side there. Um, it's still there. It's the only house there. A um, uh, few of my friends from Danville, we all moved there, which was f- hilarious because, like, we didn't know what was going on. It's just, like, I think, I think the difference is, is if you grow up in, like, Santa Cruz or a beach town, it's like your uncle's been in the North Shore or you got a hookup mm-hmm. or whatever. We're just a bunch of kooks from Danville, and we just, got, we just moved into this house, and, uh, and uh, it was hilarious. It's just, like, uh, just a frat house almost like it was just such a dump and, and Roy Russell um, at that time lived right behind us in this little, uh, like the little farmhouse and stuff. And so we would go sit back with Rory and, and learn all these stories from him. And, and so that was a really, that was our introduction down there. And it's perfect. Cause you got Jocko's there and Chun's reef. Chun's reef is pretty mellow wave. And, and so I was living there and then I moved up to Waimea Bay or something yeah, I was there for a little bit. And then I met Chris Malloy at, I think the first time we met was at, oh, it was a, a mutual friend of ours. That's right. I'd, I'd tried climbing once before I moved and I brought the shoes with me. And that girl saw those shoes in my house and she goes, oh, I have a friend that's got shoes like that. This is the weirdest thing. I, I totally forgot about this. So I had some climbing shoes that I didn't really use that were just sitting there. And she goes, oh, I have a friend that's got his shoes like that. I don't know what, what those are. And I'm like, oh, they're climbing shoes. So we're at a party. She's like, hey, this is my friend that's got those climbing shoes. And it was Chris Malloy. And of course, I knew about him at that point. And I was like, oh, hey, what's oh, up? Okay. And so we just started chit-chatting. And he was kind of an armchair climber like me. He knew about it. He was into it. He kind of tried it once or twice, but didn't take. And so we kind of nerded out like we knew about climbing. And so we talked about climbing, which is so funny. So Chris and I would see each other at parties and stuff. And our kind of connection was like, we just talk about climbing, which is so funny. And so we kind of, we weren't like friends, but we, when we saw each other, we'd always like rap about stuff, but it's interesting. It was climbing that. Cause there's no climbing community on the North shore, right? No, there's, when I moved there in the nineties, early nineties, there was some people bouldering at Waimea Bay and um, I remember going down there one time and kind of talking to them and I kind of bouldered, but I was so focused on surfing. I'm, I'm living in Hawaii on the North shore. I'm like, yeah. I'm not going to climb, you know? So I just kind of lost interest. So there is some, I'll get back to that. I did start climbing there eventually, but, um, but yeah, the, uh, there was some people climbing, but it wasn't really much of a thing. So I didn't really get into it, but Chris and I, it was funny that we just had this connection about climbing for some reason. And um, I forget how it went after that. I, Oh, I heard of this house that popped up at Rocky Point and those things, you just got to jump on them, you know? Um, and I remember our mutual friend, the same girl, she goes, Hey, I think the Malloys are looking for a place too. And then do you know Noah Johnson? Mm-hmm. Um, Noah was looking for a place. So me, Chris and Noah moved into this house at Rocky Point, I think in 95 and uh, so it was me, Chris, and Noah, and then Keith and Dan would just kind of crash here and there. And at that time, I, was, uh, I became a flight attendant in 93. Um, 92, I'm sorry. I wanted to be a fireman. That was my whole thing, and I took the test and everything. But then while, while I was doing that, I had a roommate that was a flight attendant. He goes, why don't you just become a flight attendant? It's fireman hours. You work like five to ten days a month, and you travel the world. So I, I went to one of those cattle call hirings and got hired and became a flight attendant. It's the strangest thing. Amazing. But I did that for a long time. And then um, I started lifeguarding too. So I, you have a ton of days off as a flight attendant. So I could lifeguard on my days off. So I started uh, that in 93. So I was doing both for quite, quite a long time. And the lifeguard thing started on the west side. And then I moved to the North Shore. I've heard of you talking about um, wanting or one of the appeals of the flight attendant gig was being able to travel. Yeah. What was your interest in traveling? 
It's, you know, surf, obviously, you know, um, had your parents instilled that in you at all or we didn't do, we didn't do a ton of international traveling when I was a kid. I don't think maybe, I don't even know when the first time I left the country was, but, um, I mean, just basic, like little road, we did a lot of road trips. We, you know, actually, you know, there's come to think of it mostly just California traveling around, like a lot of different road trips. Um, it's such a part of your identity now. Like it seemed like a real passion. Yeah. And it, I think it, you know, starts from just, I mean, I can go back to the skateboarding thing. Just, you want to see what's around the corner and, and as being 13 years old or, and just going into the unknown in San Francisco as age 13 was so exciting. I think that just kind of stuck with me, you know, what's, you just want to see stuff, you know? Yeah. And then surfing to me, to everybody else, I think is just such a great excuse to see places. You know, I remember my mom would, I'd come back from these surf trips and she goes, oh, did you see this or did you see that? And I'm like, no. <laughs> well, why the hell did you go? You know, right. And I go, well, no, I hung out with this family and drank in the local bar for like a month. You know, to me, that's more fulfilling than going to see the sights, you know, and surfing is such a great excuse to do that. You, you're, you're going places that you normally wouldn't go unless you were surfing. So yeah. um, the flight attendant gig was, it was such a great, great job to have is, you know, I wasn't making a ton of money, but it was enough to survive. I had a van stashed in a garage in San Francisco. I had boards stashed in Tahiti. I had, you know, I could, I mean, it was incre incredible. I could go to the airport. I'd take my board bag to FedEx. I'd get, I'd FedEx my surfboards for 25 bucks wherever I wanted to go. Crazy. And I just have to wait a day or two when I got there. I'd go jump in a first class with a backpack and just fly around. I mean, it was insane. Wow. You know, I mean, the lifestyle was just ridiculous. I remember sometimes... You know, I'd, I, we'd surf all day and it'd be Friday and we'd be drinking beers and I'd be like, I'm, I'm going to go to San Francisco and I'd just go get a flight and I'd be partying in San Francisco that night, like last call at a bar and then come back Sunday <laughs> or something, you know? It what was a just life, a, man. Yeah, it was a ridiculous life, you know? Um, um, so it was, I think the travel was mainly surf, you know, I was just wanted to, you know how it is, you're just so psyched on surfing. It wasn't, it wasn't... Um, it wasn't like I was motivated culturally, but obviously that happens. You know, you're in Indonesia and all these different places. And you know. I have two lines of questioning. I'll throw them both out. You can run with whatever, <laughs> whatever grabs you first. Uh, when did you start documenting this stuff with photos and story? And then secondly, were there any girls along the way that you wanted to hunker down with that would have thwarted that lifestyle, you know? Because that is, that's a common storyline as well for a lot of people is. Yeah, the travel. They thing, hunker yeah. down you know? Yeah. And the, the travel stops, you mean? Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, a, a partner is the one who ultimately stops that exploration lifestyle yeah. for people. Yeah. Um, and how did you avoid it? If so, you know, <laughs> how did you avoid it? That's so funny. How do you avoid that? Um, yeah. So the, the way, so I, I you know, because of um, my teacher, Lisa, Lisa Burke, she was sending me journals. I kept a journal. So I would write in that journal and during my travels. I started journaling all the time. Got it. Was, was it, it was just documenting the experience or was it story form or when did? I think it was like started with just like a journal entry of thoughts, you okay. know? And I don't think I was like, I'd have, I, you know, I haven't looked through my journals in years. I don't know. Like I just, I think I was exercising a lot too. I would, I would, I would be sitting someplace and I would like just write a scene. I remember these first time I went to mainland Mexico, Pasquale is, you know, early nineties. And, and, uh, I kept, I think those journals got lost in like a flood, but I, um, I would see a scene go down, uh, just a mundane scene in an airport or on a street corner. And I would just write about that scene. And, and then there's stuff like, you know, day to day, here I am today. You know, I think there's just like the document like here I am today. But I, I was kind of, I think it was because I was reading so much. I was, I was seeing how I could craft little stories. You know, I'll have to look at my journals to see when I started doing that. But I knew that's what I was doing for a while. And, you know, I had a, um, one of these Minolta water cameras. Have you ever seen those yellow cameras? Yeah. And because it was waterproof, I just brought that everywhere. So I was always, you know, as you do, you're, taking pictures of your tent or, you know, your yep. kids in the square or whatever. And so I was taking pictures and writing little things, but the, the way the writing started is, uh, do you know the Johnson, do you know PD Johnson? And I know of them. I 
and like, spent time the with three him. brothers, Jack Johnson, PD Johnson, Trent Johnson. Um, PD and I became really good friends um, early on c- through lifeguarding. And he was at that time writing for, he was like a staff writer for surfer, I think. Okay. And this is probably 98, 99. And I hadn't got a camera yet, but I'd been writing my journals, you know, um, I like, I hadn't got a real camera yet, but he, Chris was, I mean, sorry. Um, PD was going to go interview this guy, Walter Eric Haas. Um, Eric Haas is what we called him then. But then I think he started going by Walter brother, Walt, brother Walter. Um, but anyways, one of my favorite surfers of all time. And PD goes, Hey, I'm going to go interview him for this little thing. Do you want to go? And I, Hell yeah, this guy's such a character and he's so phenomenally talented. So we go interview him. Petey takes like a picture and we interview him. And after the interview, I told Petey, I go, it was going to go into this thing called the Surfer Guide or something, which is like an offset kind of magazine. And I go, man, he deserves so much more than just the Surf Guide. This guy is one of the best, most talented surfers in the world, I think, you know, and he's such a character. And I don't know if PD at the time was uh, being defensive or passive aggressive or he was just being nice, but he goes, well, why don't you write it? I go, seriously? And, and um, he goes, yeah, why don't, why don't you take a crack at it? So I um, wrote this whole thing about him, interviewed. I interviewed Al Chapman about him. I interviewed um, a few people around just, you know, just getting pull quotes. I interviewed Brian Kailana because Brian Kailana was my um, – my captain right. um, when I first started lifeguarding. So I interviewed Brian. Brian said some great things about him. And then I had to have my friend's wife type it out for me. I didn't know how to type. So she typed it out. And, uh, and, and then I heard of these photos of him in Kauai. And I went over to Kauai and found these, these couple photos that I had scanned of him at Honolulu Bay, like huge Honolulu Bay. And I'm on like this giant, like 10, six, no leash. Just, and that's what he, he, he'd just ride these big guns and just surf these crazy ways. But anyways, found these little prints. And then, um, I, uh, I think Chris helped me out. I was living with Chris at the time. And, and, um, I think he might've told Pesman or something, a surfer's journal I was going to drop by. I forget the sequence there, but. I always had this thing about if you want to do something, you just show up. My dad always told me that. And he's just like, just show up and just, I'm ready. Like, don't, don't mess around. So I, I flew to, I flew to, uh, um, where's Surfers Journal again? It's in San Clemente. A, yeah, I flew, I flew to LA, drove to San Clemente, had a meeting with them. And I just went in and I just showed up with like all these photos and like this typed out, printed out thing. And I just handed it to, and handed it to Scott Hewlett. So I sat down with Pesman and Scott Hewlett. And um, to me, that was enough. Like I just met, yeah, I just met Pesman and Scott Hewlett. That was awesome. And I think this is the beginning of cell phones, but I was driving away and Hewlett calls me and he's like, Hey, we're going to run with that story. And it was a mind blower for me. Cause I'm, I'm a super fan of Surface Journal. I ha- it's the only thing I collect. I have the, the entire collection of Surface Journal. I've read them all cover to cover. And to have your your stuff in there is just, for me, it's just... So I was just on cloud nine. I couldn't believe it that they were going to publish that. And so that kind of started my thing. You know, I, I didn't think of it as a job, but I said, maybe I could kind of do this. Maybe I can... I love doing this, and maybe I can do more of this, you know? And eventually got a camera to kind of fulfill that side of storytelling. And, and that's really what spurred the whole thing of just trying to document mm-hmm. things. And, you know, it turned into something, but, um, but yeah, that, that was kind of my first little, um, that's the first thing I ever got published was that. And then I, since then I've done a ton of, I think I've done like seven different feature articles for surface journal or something. Like I had a run for a while at that time. Yeah. Did you, um, um, I don't know that there, at that point, there was even a career path for writing individual articles for Surfers Journal or magazines. Yeah. If you can make them, basically, if you can make them enough money to make that a full career. But did you at least have confidence enough in your writing to where you felt like you could make a living writing, whether it would be books or anything like that? You know, I, it is funny because, you know, you add up the money. I remember getting paid and I didn't, who cares, right? I'm just, it was enough just to have it yeah. in Surfers Journal. But I was like, okay. 
how could you make a living? I'd have to do seven of those a month, which, and that took me like <laughs> three months to do. You know, like that took me so long. Exactly. I, yeah, I, and so I didn't even think of it as any kind of job. I was just, I knew I was creative, and I knew that I loved doing that, and I just wanted to do more Got of that. It. And I didn't know where it was going to go at all, you know? Yeah, because the path and, that you ultimately end up in wasn't even a job, really, at that time. You couldn't have even designed the path because it kind of met you, right? Yeah, it's just kind of, yeah, yeah, it's it's a weird It's thing. good, I mean, it's a good inspirational story for people listening to just follow whatever your passion is. Yeah. And you can make a career out of it, potentially. And not always. I mean, it could, always, there's but. certain steps along the way that if they didn't happen, maybe it wouldn't have happened. You yeah. know, I, like I pinch myself all the time. I, you know, I was just on a job in Scotland for Yeti recently and I was just like, man, I just love what I do. And I, I don't even know how I got here. Like I'm so lucky, you know? Yeah. And I think part of it is too, is, is like, there's luck, there's timing, there's, pe- you got to have a passion for it. I think that drives everything. It's just, you just, you just love yeah. this thing. And, you know, but it could go either way. You just don't know. And, you know. Well, the good news is um, you were willing to do it for free and you were also willing to continue lifeguarding and being a flight attendant in perpetuity in yeah, order to do I, those I mean, things for free. Yeah, I wasn't looking for anything more. Yeah. I'm like, I got, I'm stoked on, it's not on like, what I'm doing. Yeah, it's this not like you be- have a wife or a mortgage and kids to feed and you're oh, like, yeah. I'm quitting my job to pursue <laughs> photography. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I just, yeah, like quit my, quit everything. And, and then all of a sudden I'm like, wait, what? Yeah, exactly. Um, no, yeah. That, so yeah, that, that's, um, yeah. And then the travel thing. Um, yeah, it's, it was funny. My wife and I moved to Hawaii just recently. We moved back there with, with our daughter at the time and right before COVID. So we're there for two years and it's so great to visit North Shore 20 years later after I moved with my daughter and kind of see it through her eyes. So cool. But um, I remember when COVID hit and we we're all just staying home and I was thinking about it and I told my wife, I go, wow, I, I don't think I've stopped traveling in 30 years. Yeah. You know, like since 92, when I became a flight attendant, I think there was a time we went on strike where I might have not gone anywhere for like in maybe 93. But since then, I've been on the road. Amazing. You know, and um, and you're right. There's there's a. Uh, you, you, what did you ask? Like how you, you there, didn't meet the right person to take you off the road or what? Yeah. Or were there any girls along the way that potentially could have, uh, taken you off the road essentially? Yeah. And I, I don't know how, you know, I had girlfriends and, and, and I look back and I don't know if I was willing, I don't know. I don't know if I was like, I know I wasn't willing to budge from what I was doing, Good. so maybe that's it. The answer um, is no then. Yeah, I was just I was just kind of on this thing and you know, I, I to tell you the truth, I never really thought I was going to get married. Like I I thought I was going to be the single guy and not going to have kids and and not bummed at all. Like this, that's kind of how I saw my path. Yeah, I'm probably just not going to get married, you know. Um and didn't think I would ever have a job that could afford that. You know? Sure. And so there, I then I I didn't really even think about it. You know. Yeah. Like it happened late in life. Just kind of happened, and it was kind of out of you know left field. Yeah. But well, good. You um, got to experience the best of both worlds, then. Yeah. Because I think yeah. when you when I look at people in their twenties and they do create anchors that prevent them from exploring the world. Yeah. Um, and so take that time to really explore. Yeah. And so it's great to see that you had that kind of foresight yeah. to just commit to it and do it well and, and on the flip side too there's some people i met that did meet that person and i think it's beautiful like they they met the person it's great and, when it wor- and, yeah. and it works for some people and i admire that i'm like man you found that person and you're with them that and i think everybody if they found that person maybe would take that route it's yeah. awesome you know but um i didn't find that person or maybe i wasn't open to it right but i you know some kids asking advice these days you know my whole thing is just like go be bored go don't be in a rush like take your time like life is so short i know you don't really have a lot of time especially when you get older to hang out so like have nothing to do you know just sit around being bored is so good for you Mm. you know read a book sit around you wake up you have nothing to do do nothing just sit around don't fill your day like don't be a loser but like 
yeah, just don't don't fill your days with stuff and be in a hurry to be this or that. And I know it's the antithesis of what maybe some parents try and teach your kids. Like you got to, you know, get on the ball. You, you know, you never know. You got to, you know, go to college and get a job. And, you know, like, especially now, like, screw that. Like you can reinvent yourself at any time, especially with how okay. tech is going. And again, my thing is, uh, you know, it's different. I got lucky and maybe I'm an anomaly because of that. But um but that's my biggest thing with with kids is like, man, just just hang out, like it's, just enjoy it. Don't be in a rush, you know. It's great advice that I've never heard anybody give before. <laughs> of that, Don't, but it's great <laughs> advice. <laughs> Well, maybe I read too much Bukowski because Bukowski is all about that. He's like, man, just don't do shit. Just, yeah. but of course he was a prol prolific writer, but I mean, it's, um, he was a, an advocate of sitting around, like yeah. he would just drink beer and sit yeah. around, but he was a writer, you know, he just yeah. wrote, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, life's so short. And, and you, you, re it's all this stuff that you see in hindsight when you get older, you know, like, oh my God, I had so much time when I was younger. You, and that's the thing. That's the whole paradox of being young. You don't it know. Is. You have no idea. Or you see so many people fill their day and their life with busyness that ultimately doesn't generate anything meaningful at all. Yeah. <laughs> and so you, you almost need that breathing space in order to think of what to create yeah. and how to create it yeah. and to do something meaningful. Because if you're just busy all the time, you don't even have... Well, that that's... um, And that's the hard part as you get older, if you're in like a creative... um occupation is is your creative time is shortened because with you know i have two kids now and a, and a demanding job and you know it's like when when is that time when i'm just sitting there doing nothing it's kind of never right you know so like a long drive you know i, I go I climbing know. in yosemite and stuff maybe long drives when i go running that helps you know surfing can help if it's not that crowded out there and i'm too uh busy jogging for surf but yeah, you need that time of just like idleness where you're you're not preoccupied with anything, you know. Yeah. And it's hard with the devices, you know, it is. the phone and stuff. So um, it's an important thing to just sit there. It is. Let's take a bathroom break. Yeah, I gotta blow my nose. All right, cool. 